that level of alarm that you might get with anger is going to be heightened if it's in your love relationship because that person has access to your money, your house, your body, everything. So, you know, people would think, why am I feeling this powerful negative emotion if I'm in love? It's like because you are also very, very vulnerable to betrayal and other things. All right. Welcome to the show, Carla. Great to have you. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. I know for a lot of our audience members, emotions can be a struggle to grapple with and understand. So I think it'd be super helpful if we just start by defining what emotions are. Well, there are a lot of ideas about that, but the ones I like best to talk about emotions as aspects of cognition. So it's not the opposite of rationality. It's a very important part of rationality. A lot of people would say, you know, I don't want to talk to you until you're less emotional. I'm like, well, then you're never going to talk to me (laughs) because emotions are a part of everything you are and everything you do. The sociologist of emotion, Arlie Hochschild, calls them our most important sense and that they are how we make sense of the world. And I think a lot of people see them as very different than that, right? Uh, Certainly what what I was taught. If you're being emotional, you're therefore not rational. You're therefore not logical. And I was thinking of Mr. Spock the other day, and he was very... (laughs) I mean, I think that's where we all learned it. It was from Mr. Spock, that you would either be logical or emotional, but there's, you know, they don't come together. And with that, we often label emotions good, bad. We attribute negatives and positives to emotions, but that's not a healthy way to look at them. No, because if I tell you an emotion is negative and you feel it, you know, you're going to feel other things too, right? And you're going to feel as if you're a failure. And if I tell you an emotion is positive and you don't feel it, you're going to feel other things too. So right away with that negative and positive idea, you're almost inviting a pileup of emotion that maybe you can't deal with very well, right? Because it's not just that one emotion. Now it's your emotions about your emotions. And and then do you know how to deal with any of them? Because now you've got a bunch (laughs) that maybe you don't know about. Yeah. So taking that negative and positive bit off is one of the most important things. It's one of the most important things you can do. You say an emotion is an emotion. It's part of my sensing of the world. It's part of my making sense of the world. It is one of my senses. And there's no bum emotions. They're all worth something. I know for myself, I started doing men's work about seven years ago, and I recognized that I had a rather stunted emotional vocabulary. I struggled to even understand and label the emotions that I was feeling, and I defaulted to just a few descriptors. And through men's work, I've recognized that there are families to emotions, there are ranges to those emotions, and being able to describe them and increase your vocabulary is super important, not just for communication, but also for self-awareness. So for those in our audience who might be in a similar situation, struggling to make sense of their emotional vocabulary, what do we mean by that, and how can we strengthen it? There's some really good research, and I'm glad you brought that up. There's some really good research that shows that just getting a better emotional vocabulary all by itself will give you better emotion regulation skills. And that's so easy, it's free. (laughs) So if your emotional range is, I feel crappy, I feel happy, (laughs) that is not enough words for you. (laughs) So i was gathering, before I even read this research, I gathered a bunch of words, you know, through just on my website, on social media. I was like, give me words for emotions and let's organize them. And so now we've got this massive list of emotions, but they are by emotion and by intensity of emotion. So it's soft anger, medium anger, intense anger, soft jealousy, medium jealousy, you know, and they're alphabetized. It's so organized. It's like a spreadsheet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so you can just go to this list and you can say, I feel crappy. Now you go and look at what does that mean for you? Is it sad? Well, what level of sad? Is it angry? Right? Is it sad and angry? What about depression? You know, what are you actually feeling? And just knowing what you're feeling. My theory is that you're telling your body what's happening instead of your body saying, Am I sick? Is it 
Tuesday? Am I angry? You know, what am I feeling? And you're able to tell your body, no, I'm feeling a tiny bit of anger. It's kind of peevishness. And I'm feeling some sadness at the medium level. (laughs) It's kind of, no, it's a little despair, you know, and, and you would think this is going to make everything worse, right? Because now I've said the emotions and I'm going to be drawn down into them, but with no skills. But what happens is your whole body sort of goes, oh, that's all. Okay, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I'm going to be good. Okay, despair. That's an interesting word. Do you know what I mean? You, it's almost like not getting yourself out of the emotion, but giving it a context. And now your body can move along with its day. Yeah. Yeah. And making sense of the emotions by having a better understanding of the intensity and then potentially what may have caused that reaction. So we could recognize some patterns to make some changes and help us regulate those emotions seems really impactful. But I I know Johnny and I were both smiling because we know a lot of people who just label their emotions as crappy or happy. (laughs) And that's, that's the depth that we have with our vocabulary. I think for a lot of people, in order to label them properly or to give them any time to find a descriptive that, that applies well, I think people are a little bit too nervous to hang out in those emotions to figure that out. So it's like, <laughs> hey, I feel crappy, and then they, they move on. And then, and then they just deal with that th- throughout the day. But again, when we have a, a larger emotional vocabulary, it just makes the things so much easier. It gives you an idea of, of what can I do in this moment to get to the next level or to feel better. Now that I have a, a better vocabulary, I know that, well, I'm a little under the weather. I'm not at my best, but perhaps some coffee will get me to where I need to be. <laughs> Is that how we fix emotions? I have to write that down. Okay. That's Johnny's <laughs> self-diagnosis. <laughs> Coffee fixes many emotions, especially in the morning. Okay, good. Good. Emotions equals coffee. Okay, good. I'm writing Anytime. <laughs> For any confusion before 11, uh, that's what it is. <laughs> so not only understanding for yourself, but then being able to communicate it to people that matter in your life, whether it's coworkers, whether it's your partner, whether it's your friends, actually having that vocabulary to draw from to then share with others what the real emotion is going on for you allows you to connect more easily, allows you to be supported in those difficult moments or in those super happy, exciting moments to really recognize and and label properly what that emotion is, allows other people to just feel closer to you. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say there's a caveat there because some people, they don't like emotions to be named. And I even created a list of words for people who don't feel comfortable talking about emotions because that became very clear to people as they developed a stronger emotional vocabulary. They're like, but my family doesn't want to hear any of it. And so we found some words that are just wonderful. Three of them are magic. They are bad, stressed, and unhappy. So if you say you're stressed... People will understand something's wrong, but you haven't actually said the name of an emotion. So you no. can <laughs> to get out of jail free card. <laughs> yeah. And if you say I feel bad, everybody can get that, right? And unhappy, I mean it's got happy in there, but you're un. And the opposite. So, <laughs> I'm I'm unhappy. So for people who have a strong emotional vocabulary and they realize they're in a place where they're that's not okay. I think for a lot of people, they would just repress their awareness. And I'm like, don't repress. Use some words that can keep you in the conversation. All right, so I can know in myself, or I, f- I feel these five emotions right now. But this person would hear stressed. <laughs> and they yeah. would, that would be like a little, I don't know, a keyword for them to know that things aren't going well. Right. What's interesting is all three of those are negative. Yeah. Well, I think we're all okay saying that we're happy. Yeah. Unless you know someone, yeah, yeah, to show happiness, to smile, to show joy, to show contentment. I think we've all been socialized to be okay with those emotions, right? And even to want to go to them when we're feeling another emotion. So I'm feeling sad. Damn it. I just want to feel happy again. And happiness is like 
but it's not a happy, what, what are you even talking about? <laughs> it's not a happy time right now. Why would you want that emotion? But I think most of us are taught that you need to have that emotion so you can be more pleasant for other people to be around. Yeah. And I think in general, people want to have a decent sense of how you're feeling. They don't want it to be completely hidden from them. Yeah, maybe. So Unless being it's able rage. to share. <laughs> yeah, while driving, especially <laughs> want to avoid. Yeah. But very often in small talk, that's the first thing. You know, how's your day going? How are you feeling? These are very surface level questions that we start conversation with. So having something to label is better than ignoring. Yeah. But I think people mostly want to hear fine. How are you doing? Fine. It's okay. all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, let's not explore that any further. <laughs> so when it comes to stretching that vocabulary, walk us through how we can start to understand the families of emotions and, and start our self-assessment so we can get more in touch and in tune with the vocabulary of emotions. Yeah, I put the emotions in four families just to make it really simple. And when we start with kids, there's the four you know, families. They are anger sadness, happiness, and fear. And if you can even get add two more to crappy and happy, you can go, what, is, what would a sadness be? Slappy? No, <laughs> it, has to, it has to rhyme. <laughs> if you could get sadness, happiness, anger, and fear, you would at least begin to start to dial down, right? You would at least have four directions to go into. And then you can get more clarity there. Are you feeling ashamed? Are you feeling bored? Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling confused? Right? So you can get more emotions in there. I work with 17 emotions and you would think that's entirely too many emotions. <laughs> you need to fix that. But those are the emotions that have been mostly identified. And they are each different enough that they, they deserve their own category. So sadness is different from grief. Depression is different from suicidal urge. Fear is different from anxiety. Anxiety is different from panic. Jealousy and envy are too close together but separate emotions. Yeah, it's just a, a wonderful world of cognition and sensation and sense making. And when you understand the emotions, when you feel them, it's no longer a problem. So you can say, I feel envy, which means there's some unfairness in the system. That's a lot better than I've just stepped into one of the seven deadly sins of Catholicism and I may go to hell. Right. right? Guilt that goes along with that. <laughs> I may go to hell soon. Um, that's a lot better to be able to say, you know, envy is telling me something here rather than I am failing as a person because I feel a normal human emotion. <laughs> So recognizing the vocabulary, strengthening your emotional vocabulary, how can we use that to then skillfully use our emotions and the signals that those emotions are telling us? Yeah, just identifying them will help you regulate yourself. So you have the cognitive space you need to think about it. And then I teach what each emotion does and how it works. And at first, it's a little bit of a game changer where you sort of have to go, wait, what does, you know, you'd look at your chart, what does shame mean? Because, you know, and to understand that each emotion has a job to do, it's almost like their organs. So your liver can't do what your heart does and your stomach can't do, you know, what your, what your gallbladder does. The emotions are like that too. Anger can't do what happiness does and happiness can't do what anger does. They, we need different ones. We need these 17 aspects of basically intelligence. Okay. So walk us through that signal of anger, because I know a lot of our audience members, certainly the male <laughs> cross-section of our audience members might be living more so in that emotion than ever. Yes. And men are welcomed into anger. They are not welcomed into sadness though, or grief. So if you see a crying man call the hospital, right? <laughs> because he's not being a man right now. So a lot of men are chased away from sadness and grief, but they're welcomed into anger. Anger is about boundaries. So when you feel anger coming up, look around and see what boundary was just crossed. And then you have an option about how you're going to reset that boundary. If 
you're like most of us, you've learned two pretty terrible options. One is to repress your anger and ignore it. And that means that the boundary is not going to get put back up, right? It's nothing's going to happen. The other is to overexpress it and become violent. You know, hey, screw you. That's a boundary. But it may damage the relationship. Well, so would uh, repressing anger because now that person doesn't even know what they did because you are not engaging. So we learn a third way, like the third path of working with the anger is to understand it's about boundaries. And you can reset a boundary in many different ways. You can set it by saying, oh, it doesn't matter, whatever, whatever, which is nothing. You can say, hey, screw you or punch someone. That's something. But also you can speak to what happened. You say, when you didn't show up at three and I was waiting for you and I was paying for parking, you know, whatever, um, that really that really bothered me. Instead of going way over the top, you're still setting a boundary, but it doesn't have to be done with too much or not enough. It's sort of like, it's just right. It's Goldilocks <laughs> anger <laughs> where you, you choose the, the way that's just right. So something that you have for... Anger is about boundaries. Certainly, we have our fair share of of guys who have found us due to those boundaries being taken advantage of. And rather than engage and understand that they're angry due to that, they usually take it personally and end up trying to figure out what is wrong with me that I was taken advantage of. Yes. And which is only going to lead to more and more dissatisfaction and getting taken advantage of. I think it's men need to understand that it's okay to feel anger and that it is about boundaries. And how are you going to set those up or convey those to other people rather than trying to avoid an emotion that basically has allowed you to survive up until this point? Because again, if it's about boundaries, Without anger, we don't have no boundaries. We don't procreate. And our procreate, procreation does not evolve and, and reach adulthood. So I think anger has gotten a bad rap. Yes, it has. And again, this is one of those emotions that I think people would attribute bad or negative to. And people need to get back in touch with all of their emotions uh, because anger certainly can lead to violence but it is a survival mechanism that you need to protect yourself and your family. Yeah. And if you know anger and you know that there are many different levels of anger. So let me read from the soft list. You can be ambivalent, annoyed, displeased, frustrated. You can go to intense anger. You can be livid, loathing, passionate, powerful, projecting, raging, right? So many words for anger, but they're all about boundaries. I don't think there's a lot of men who would have put passionate and anger together, but it's it funny. is absolutely <laughs> it passionate. Is, yeah. 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 Then what I did with these, I'm reading from the emotional vocabulary list. It's a pocket size list <laughs> that you can carry around with you. Super but helpful. I wanted to make sure to put all of the I'm saying positive and negative right now, but I wanted to put all the positive attributes of each emotion, as well as what everybody knows that you're, you know, you're raging and you're furious, but you're also passionate. You cannot do any kind of like social justice work without your anger because anger says, hey, it is not okay that people are living in the streets in the wealthiest. Do you know what I mean? It's like your anger would say, that's a boundary that got crossed and that is not okay with me. You can't do your work in the world of creating equality and fairness and anti-racism without your anger. But how do you and your anger work together? You know, does your anger go on a rampage every time it comes out? I would say, let's look at how you can work with anger at a lower intensity. It also really helps if your anger goes to 15 on a scale of one to 10, every time it shows up, (laughs) what I like to do is work with the soft presentation of anger, the words, and to help people grab their anger when it's at a lower intensity where they can work with it. 
right? Because when my anger goes to 15, y'all just better watch out, okay? <laughs> y'all just yeah. better, everybody watch out. But if I'm catching myself at anger three, four, five, and by studying the soft anger list, I'm irritated, I'm peeved, I'm protective, I'm quiet, I'm rankled, I'm separate, I'm steady, then I can understand and work with anger more easily. It's not sort of anger management, but anger awareness. Is right. If your anger goes to 15, catch it when it's at three. Address it then, and it doesn't need to go to 15. Well, that's the downside of a stunted vocabulary is you yeah. struggle to recognize those earlier signals yes. that could keep you from getting to that rage-filled moment. Yes, you could catch it earlier and develop skills now there are some times when you need to go to anger 15. I'm saying never I'm not saying never do it. But if it's every single time, then I think you need some flexibility within your anger response mechanism, right? <laughs> you need to add some stuff in there. But to be able to befriend your anger and to say, "Okay, I'm feel uh, I'm I'm getting steamed up right now. Let me see what my options are. Who stepped across a boundary? What are my values? What's going on?" Yeah. And that rise in self-awareness leads to emotional intelligence around others too. You could recognize when they're irritated and that frustration's about to boil over. Yes. So in a work environment, you can actually head them off at the pass in terms of conflict by recognizing, okay, you know, I'm starting to see them get steamed under the collar here. And that frustration could turn out to hurt a teammate or could get us off course or, or lead us to being unproductive for an entire meeting. Yes. Recognizing that earlier with that gradation of these emotions not only helps yourself, but can help you manage and communicate more effectively in a team environment, a work environment. Yes. Understand the emotions of others. I mean, you first have to understand your own, but it's what makes social life work, right? And understanding the emotional tone of others and which emotions they're good at. I mean, you learn it over time. But yeah, without emotional intelligence and awareness, you're kind of a pinball pinging around the social world, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you're just kind of not aware of what's going on. Well, for many of our clients, they're drawn to work with us. They want to increase their emotional intelligence to be successful in their career, to grow their network, and to have a better social circle. And oftentimes, they want to first look outward. Okay, how do I read people's body language? How do I pick up these signals in others? How can I tell what their emotional state is? And we actually dial them back first to go, hey, well, let's understand our own emotional state. And what's your yeah. default emotional yeah. state? And then what emotions come up for you when you're stressed and you're in an environment that puts some pressure on you? Yeah. Recognizing that is a key first step before focusing outward and trying to develop emotional intelligence by just observing others. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. If I don't know in myself what's going on, and also if people tend to be sensitive or hypersensitive, they may pick up emotions in the room without knowing how to work with them, right? So they just get overwhelmed. So they don't have any practice for anxiety, but they can feel it, and then they go into anxiety, and now everybody's anxious, <laughs> right? And nobody knows how, how to work with it, right? So yeah, I think becoming aware of yourself is so important. So I can say, I can see that Dave over there is really anxious about this project. I am feeling something different, but how can I respond to him? Do you know what I mean? Instead of, no, now we're both, you know, now we're both feeling the exact same thing. Well, for some of our clients, if their default state is frustrated, then that's the lens they're experiencing others through. And now you have an opportunity not recognizing that you're just in that frustrated state to label others' emotions in a different light than yeah. if you were there calm or present or in a lower anxiety. So recognizing your own default state and painting that vocabulary helps with regulation and then helps you observe more realistically the emotions that are presenting in others. To go along with that, I, people need to understand that you are influenced by everything around you and you don't have a choice in the matter. If you're there, you're being influenced by that stimuli. Now, you can be aware of the stimuli and how it's making you feel, and you can decide at that point if you want to leave or not, but you will be moved in that place. And when we open our computers, we're exposed to marketing all day long, again, which is 
<laughs> targeted stimuli to uh, affect us uh, for ideas, products we are being marketed to all the time. So getting that understanding of, of that default and, and getting grounded is certainly very helpful in a world where, well, we're, we're sponges. So it's, it's, we need it. Yeah. We're a social species. We learn from each other. Like you can't have a baby growing up without humans. They don't develop language. They don't develop anything. I mean, we become human by being with other humans. We are socialized animals. We aren't born like animals who know how to walk, you know, and who know what food to eat. We don't know nothing. We have to learn from other people. And you're right, John, that is true throughout your entire life. You will be affected by others and you will learn your cues. I also like your point about marketing. Marketing knows that emotions are how we function. 100%. Marketing comes into our emotions. They just, I, I sometimes I will watch ads and I go, I see which emotions you're trying to get there, and I choose not to. <laughs> My favorite thing in order to combat that, because it is something that we have to deal with uh, at all times, is to start challenging the adverts. So, my the first question is, who is sending me this ad? So you can do some research, you can look into the, the company, you can look into who they are and what they're about. And then who is this ad targeting? Because a lot of times I see things and I'm like, why am I seeing this? How am I, how, what did I click on? This has nothing to do with Or I'm like, man, this ad is good. This is right up my alley. I'm always right. So th that ad is going to have some sort of stimuli to put you in an emotional state. So the next question is, well, what do these adverts or this company or this advertising marketing want me to feel? So then I will write what the, the, the emotions are that they want to invoke in me. And then lastly, what is the call to action? Now that I am upset, angry, happy, whatever it might be, and a lot of marketing is fear-based because that's a m major motivator, right? Now that I'm utterly terrified, <laughs> what do they want me to do? <laughs> Right? Buy this skin vote, cream. Vote for this person. <laughs> buy this skin cream. Make a, a donation. Wh whatever it is, and for me, having that little checklist. First of all, it's fun because you learn a lot about marketing. You learn a lot about the people who are trying to get your attention and your motivations. But again, everything is marketing, so it comes in very useful. But answering those questions allows me to create distance from that ad and look at it objectively. Right? I, can, I can now look at it or just disconnect it and poke fun at it. We, you need to create like a group where people meet and just look at ads and then call out the emotions, call it out. But then I'm seeing ads like one after another maybe 60 ads in a day, maybe more. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. We're just inundated with emotional yes. manipulation. Right. An another reason why people need to learn about their emotions uh, so that they, they are well armed for the barrage of marketing that is coming their way. <laughs> it's coming for you. Oh, it's already here. <laughs> I mean, I've bought stuff that I, I'm like, why did I buy this? <laughs> I think it's hard for people to recognize that emotions can actually lead to action, which is why so much of this advertising is evoking emotions first before the call to action. They want you to feel something, so then you react in a way that makes the purchase, signs up for the newsletter, joins the group, makes whatever action that they're seeking possible by first evoking that emotion. Yeah, uh, with a lot of music cues. Music is so powerful. Yeah, so powerful in terms of what we're supposed to feel. <laughs> so there's another emotion I'd love to unpack with you because I know for a lot of our audience members, it comes up in relationships and that's jealousy. Jealousy. Which can feel like anger to some in some situations, but let's unpack jealousy for our audience and, and how to better manage it skillfully. Jealousy is one of our main social emotions, right? A jealousy and envy and anger and shame. These are social emotions that teach us how to be in community. Jealousy comes up, I call it relational radar. It comes up 
on those issues of love, commitment, security, fairness, intimacy, connection, and loyalty. I like to engage jealousy before I get into relationships. (laughs) Because a lot of people just... I like oranges. You like oranges. Let's have sex and get married. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is basically the level of choosing a lot of people do with their, <laughs> with their love relationships. Okay. And I'm like, you would spend more time buying a car than you did getting into that relationship. And so when we don't have good agreements at the beginning of a relationship, when we're not really clear why we're getting in, when we haven't really seen how the other person behaves, our jealousy will need to be up more because we're in a kind of an insecure place. We don't really know if we can rely on this person. When they do step across those lines into some level of betrayal, our jealousy may come up at 15 out of 10, because we don't have that stability we need to understand who this person is or what. They like oranges, but (laughs) we don't really understand their level of depth or commitment in the relationship. So jealousy will and should come up when there's some kind of betrayal. And basically the person is stepping over a boundary of the relationship. There is anger in jealousy. They're stepping over what was agreed to, or they're stepping away from a sense of providing security. So jealousy has a purpose, but most of us have learned of it as the green eyed monster, right? So when we feel jealous, the only sort of model we have, role model, is a green-eyed monster. And we kind of spin out. And instead of saying, what kinds of intimacy do I desire and want to offer? You know, getting really clear with yourself, is this relationship offering me what I need? Or do I need to make other plans? Right? And that would be jealousy at a very kind of five level, you know, four or five saying, I see what happened. Is this ever going to be okay with me? And instead, because we only have monster as the role model, we go ballistic. And I think with jealousy, it's also really important to understand the soft presentation of it, which is like a suspicion, a sense of, is everything right here? Is this what needs to be going on here instead of you betrayer, you know, you infidel. Um, So I think it's a very powerful emotion like anger, right? It's a part of our social survival. We need each other and we need loyal people who are right up close to us. So that level of alarm that you might get with anger is going to be heightened if it's in your love relationship, because that person has access to your money, your house, your body, everything. So you know, people would think, I'm in love. Why am I feeling this powerful kind of negative? I'm going to say the word negative. Why am I feeling this powerful negative emotion if I'm in love? It's like, because you are also very, very vulnerable to betrayal and other things. Well, you brought up an important point that I think it's missed in a lot of these situations, especially for our clients, is the explicit explanation of the boundary versus the covert contract yes. <laughs> and the assumption of the boundary. And oftentimes that betrayal can arise in situations where you haven't actually communicated a boundary, but you feel internally like a boundary has been breached. But due to being a people pleaser or not wanting to cause conflict needlessly, you avoid stating the boundary and then betrayal, distrust peeks its ugly head into that relationship because you weren't an effective communicator of what your wants and needs were and what those boundaries are in your relationship. Yeah, early on. That's why I kind of like to have jealousy there at the first date. It's like, so here's what I want. Monogamy, that's important to me or not, right? Or polygamy is important to me. How do you feel about that, right? That's not something you want to be surprised with later. (laughs) That's not not a good surprise. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, I think a lot of people are sort of like, do you like me? Do you like me? Will you have sex with me? There's none of that sort of, here's what needs to happen before you decide you like me. You know, or here's what needs to happen before we become intimate. What I like to highlight is that feeling of distrust, you know, recognizing that early on and asking yourself, okay, do I need to communicate something if I've been clear about my wants and needs in the situation? Whereas for a lot of people, that distrust is a trigger to unlock their phone and search on their social media and look for more things to 
validate that feeling of distrust instead of looking internally and saying, okay, but did I communicate what I want out of this relationship, what my expectations are, what I'm bringing to the table in terms of boundaries? Yeah, and that's the work of jealousy. So doing that, you know, becoming aware of what kinds of intimacy do you require and what do you want to offer to others? I think until my third marriage, I never even had that conversation with anybody. I was just like, okay, we like oranges. Let's let's get married. Here's my credit card. <laughs> Sounds fun. Until <laughs> the green-eyed monster's there. Yeah, and Jealousy's like, you could have asked a couple of questions here, okay? Before we got there. <laughs> yeah. One piece that I'd love to unpack is the idea that the more that we focus on strengthening our emotional vocabulary, the easier it is for us to develop empathy. And I know we have a number of clients we work with who will oftentimes feel, well, I wouldn't feel that emotion in that situation, or I wouldn't feel betrayed, or I wouldn't feel jealous, and therefore they struggle with empathy and allowing the other person's emotions and feelings to be validated. So what can we do to strengthen our empathy as a skill now that we've recognized all these emotions and strengthen our vocabulary? Yeah, empathy is first and foremost an emotional skill. So if you don't have, you know, your vocabulary and stuff and you're like, well, I wouldn't have felt jealousy in that situation. So ask yourself, well, what would you have felt? So use your perspective taking, which is a part of empathy. So in that situation, what would I have felt? Why did they feel that way? You know, it's like a opening the range of your emotional life to see where would you have felt that so that you can get some empathy by moving into a situation where that would have happened for you and not discounting that other people feel different ways. I think that perspective taken is huge. I find so often that recognizing the emotional vocabulary and the range, even if you might not feel the intensity you can at least directionally with those families get it right and see, okay, well, I would definitely be frustrated. I might not be rage filled, but you know, when someone cuts my wife off, she's rage filled. When someone cuts me off, I'm frustrated, but I can understand based on the family and the intensity of how in her shoes she could feel that way. Yeah. Like this is much more important to her than it is to me. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, being on time, yeah. Yeah. you know, like the cause of that. I'm being cut off now. I'm missing a light in LA and I'm going to be late to something and I like being on time. Whereas I feel there's a little more flexibility on being on time in LA. So I get frustrated and not rage filled when I miss a light due to someone cutting me off. <laughs> <laughs> so what yeah. else can we do to strengthen our empathy, recognizing that this is an important part of emotional intelligence? You know what's really cool about empathy is you can change, you can increase it, or you can calm it down depending on where you are with your empathy at any stage of your life. It's a skill. It's also a trait, but it's more a skill and an interaction than it is a trait. Drama and fiction are absolutely brilliant ways to work on your empathy because in fiction, you become the protagonist and things happen to you and you're putting on the body and the emotions of another person. So good movies will do that. Good TV, especially long series where you watch character arcs over a period of time are excellent for developing and honing your empathy. So Korean dramas, here we come. <laughs> We're going to Netflix. I'm working on my empathy, y'all. <laughs> it's a great reason to, to <laughs> sit in front of the TV. I'm growing my empathy. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, not for you. Get out. <laughs> yeah. The reason drama, you know, plays as well, music, all art is a way to speak with emotion, music, dance, drama, fiction, um, all of it is a way to transmit emotion to others. So the more art that you can take in, the more emotions and empathy, you're, you're widening your, your field of view. Yeah. And I would certainly recommend for our audience that they use as many senses as possible to perceive and pick up on those emotions. So not just passively watching, reading, novels and, and seeing how authors develop emotions through a story, 
because these emotions are universal. So, you, you know, I have not gone on a hero's journey like Luke Skywalker, but I can relate to the emotions that he's feeling and the betrayal and what happened to his family and then going after on that journey. That's a, just a normal, natural part of storytelling and why we are drawn to these plays and movies and books and TV shows in the first place. I was thinking for kids, a lot of people look at children's books and say, well, that's just too scary. But kids love that stuff. They love the big emotions. You know, they love the the monsters. And I, I, obviously adults do too, because of the Marvel universe. Um, we love yeah. our monsters and we love our big dramatic stories. And it's good for us. It's good to take time to feel big emotions in a safe way and see how other people do it. Yeah. <laughs> so what's always been fun for, for Johnny and I in, in class and in teaching emotions and recognizing emotions in others is the question of how much emotions are too much. <laughs> it's like, oh, AJ, I, I can't express overwhelming happiness. It's going to be too much for other people to see me that emotional, especially for men. I, I feel like that's a real gradient that they are concerned about is not wanting to be too emotional in, in situations, good or bad emotions. So how much emotion is too much? Do you remember that politician Howard Dean? Oh, yeah. Uh, and and he lost the ability to run for president because he went like this. Rawr! Like, emotion what? Sank <laughs> what? his entire campaign. <laughs> that is ridiculous. And now we've got candidates who I don't even want to talk about it. Okay. I do not even want to talk about what candidates are getting away with today. I wish they would just go, yeah, and we could, we could cancel them all. Yeah. <laughs> but there's very much a rule for men with emotions that you have to be cool. You have to hold it in. But even for women, like to be extremely joyous, sort of in a regular everyday life, people would say, yeah, that's too much. I would say almost any emotion in, in its intense range would be too much for a lot of people. They would, they would say, yeah, you're too much. I think you want to also surround yourself with people who express emotion in the way that you do or open-minded to how you express emotion. When we first started this company, one of the things that we were helping our clients with was, was it was helping men uh, speak with ladies. And some of the main issues that we were seeing back then, and now it's just, it's the same issues now, just in different surroundings, such as more in the career, but it was about expressing themselves in front of women. And the amount of women that have told me, oh, I had to end the relationship or, or I just wasn't feeling it. And of course, my question is, oh, why so? Oh, what did he do? What didn't he do? What turned you off? The answer I always got was, I didn't get any emotion. And so if you can't pick up on what somebody else is feeling, you're always going to have this sort of black box in your mind, which results in feeling vulnerable and a lot of anxiety. So that doesn't allow you to feel comfortable and in a relationship. So of course you're going to remove yourself from that. And now we're seeing the same things as now that our work is more geared to helping people network and their careers, which again, they're now in an office with people who are unable to read them, who are unable to connect through emotion. And that doesn't bode well for getting a raise. That doesn't help out in getting a promotion. If I'm going to give somebody a raise or a promotion, I want them in, emphatic and I want their energy to infect and give me more energy. Yeah. I want to see that enthusiasm. That energy is what makes the office run well. And the better the emotions, the better the morale in that office. So you want, you want to make sure that that chemistry is good. And the only way that you can do that is by being able to read those emotions. Yeah. It's like table tennis, ping pong. If you can't see what's being served, then you're not even going to see the ball. And that's, that's it. That's the game's over. It's like to play back and forth with emotion is fun. And I think that's why watching drama, watching or reading fiction is seeing the movement back and forth between people. Well, with that, you know, the rise of stoicism, the poker face at work, not wanting to show emotion, good or bad, or certainly nothing intense, can come across as very off-putting and uncomfortable for other people experiencing that. When you're bottling emotions, when you're 
withholding emotions, you might think you're doing a good job in withholding them by not verbalizing them. But oftentimes when we see in our video work, well, it's coming through in your body language. It's coming through in your facial expressions. And sometimes it's even painful to watch someone bottling those emotions instead of just sharing them openly. Yeah. And it's hard if you're sensitive within that social group. And the bottling of emotions, it sends such a message to people, but you think you're not doing anything. And you think you're not sending any messages because you're bottling your emotions. And you're like, nope, you're loud. You're loud over there with your not emotions. <laughs> yeah. But it can cast a pall on the entire social group, right? I mean, everybody can say, okay, I guess bottling emotions is what we do here because he's doing it, you know? And then, and then it all begins to fall apart. Well, what we find in a lot of our clients is they end up in surface level relationships because they can't get to that trust point. You can't trust another person if you don't know what emotions they're actually expressing, if they're withholding them through stoicism and, and trying their best to be as even keel as possible. But emotions are a normal, natural human experience. And yes. if we want to be in relationships, whether it's a work relationship, a social relationship, a romantic relationship, we want to know how the other person's feeling. We want to be able to connect on that emotion and, and not be put at a distance. So that stoicism withholding works against you when we're trying to connect with one another. It really does. And, and I'm just thinking as you're talking that so many men have been so injured and abused around their emotions, just slapped upside the head every day about their emotions. And uh, it pisses me off, I'm gonna tell you, let me go see what I'm feeling. Uh, <laughs> I'm feeling enraged, livid. And emotions are like our birthright. They are parts of our brain, parts of our ability to make sense of the world. So by telling men that they're not allowed to feel, we're actually, we're crippling them in the social realm. It makes me angry because a deeply feeling man is one of the most beautiful things in the world. And to miss that through social training and abuse is, it hurts everybody. There's a lot of emotions tied into a lot of masculine traits, such as loyalty and honor, that we need in order to be proper men. Yeah. Well, I know for myself and the way I was raised, you know, those emotions and being emotional and showcasing emotions was frowned upon. It was seen as not something I should be doing from a young age. And what developed out of that for me was an inability to emotionally regulate. I could not catch any of the ranges. And then on top of it, I could not even get to a place of understanding what my wants and needs were because yes. I was constantly modulating my emotional response to please others first and foremost, instead of just trying to figure out, well, what am I feeling and, and why am I feeling that way and how can I self-regulate? I was regulating simply to please everyone around me. And then when someone would turn around and say, well, what do you actually want? I'm sitting there completely stumped. <laughs> Not, I don't know. What, sure do what, want want. Want? <laughs> well, exactly. what do you want me to want? What do you want me to want? Tell me what I should want. Let me know. <laughs> Give me a clue here. Yeah. yeah. I and mean, so people talk about the patriarchy being bad for women. And I'm like, it's just as bad for men. It's the archy that's the problem. <laughs> okay. It's not the patri. It's not males being in charge because I see men and especially boys damaged by how we've separated the genders and all this nonsense both being damaged so much. I'm like, let's get rid of it. Not have a matriarchy because it's going to be just as bad in the other direction, but <laughs> something where, you know, we're not being pressured to be either for men unemotional and kind of dead inside or for women to be hyper emotional. And it's like, we need to balance with each other. We need to come to some media, middle place where we can all just be human beings with normal human emotions. Well, I'd love to talk about that balance because one of the questions we get is, okay, I, I know that I'm going to be walking into high stress, anxiety situations. I have a job interview. I'm going to a networking event and I'm an introvert. I'm going on a first date and I know I'm going to be high anxiety in that situation. It's going to be stressful for me. What can I do in those moments to regulate my emotions in a, a manner that allows me to communicate effectively and connect with the other person? Anxiety is a, a beautiful emotion that most people hate, but its job, <laughs> its job is to help you prepare for things you're not prepared for. And so with anxiety, it's doing your prep work, writing down what you're afraid of, writing down like the worst case scenario, 
and then planning for it. There were some studies done on students who were told they were taking a calculus test and they have 30 minutes. That was the the experiment. And some were allowed to go and meditate. Some were just allowed to sit for 30 minutes. And some were allowed to write down what they were afraid of, right? And you would think, don't write down what you're afraid of. It's going to break your courage. Well, we were all wrong. Because the ones who were allowed to write down what they were afraid of, which means they were being honest with their emotions, their anxiety was coming out and saying, okay, you do not know the cosine. You do not know what, how to use a cosine, okay? They did well on the test, and the ones who meditated did not, and the ones who sat there did not. So being emotionally honest with anxiety is really the most important thing. And have some time to write down, I think I'm going to just say all the wrong things. And then find, go to Google and say, how do I say the right things, right? It's like, fill yourself. There's some professionals of anxiety, actors, because they're going to go on stage live. Lord, anything could happen. Anything, they could forget their lines. And their rule is preparation, preparation, preparation. And so with those fears, it's not to treat them as like, oh, that's never going to happen. You're just being silly. Listen to each one of them and prepare. I mean, it takes some time, but it's better than being overwhelmed and unable to speak because you don't actually know what you're afraid of or what your anxiety is trying to point out. Yeah, I think it's a more effective way to to use the signal that anxiety is giving you than to withdraw and avoid anxious moments and get further in your comfort zone instead of stretching yourself. Yeah. Another thing is a lot of, when I did my book on anxiety, it's called Embracing Anxiety. And I asked everybody, Tell me your anxiety stories. They were to a person, including psychiatrists and psychologists, talking about panic. They weren't even in the right emotion. So <laughs> anxiety is about preparing for a future that you're not prepared for. Panic is about saving your life. So if there's any dread or danger in your anxiety, panic is there too. And that's not a bad thing, but it's important to know the difference between your emotions, okay? Because with anxiety, you prepare. With panic, you have fight, flee, freeze, flock to safety. It's a very fast emotion, very intense. So it's important to say, okay, what about going to this blind date is so threatening to me that my panic has come forward, which is the emotion that saves your life? Well, there could be a lot of things, right? There could be a lot of things about this blind date that feel life-changing or life-threatening. Or at least, do you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, panic is there for a reason. But when anxiety, which is very forward leaning and has lots and lots of information and panic, which is a very powerful emotion, when they're together, you can sort of lose yourself, right? You're just being pushed forward. So working these two emotions is really important. It's like, is my life physically in danger panic? And they're like, well, maybe not at the date, <laughs> but I'm just looking out for you. <laughs> yeah. So, so gleaning the information from these emotions, knowing what part of cognition that they hold for you is a way to begin working with them in different ways. And it's not that you won't be overwhelmed by emotion because sometimes emotions need to come up at a really high level, but that you'll at least have some idea of what's happening inside you, you know? when you're feeling rage, it's a boundary. So what's the boundary? Instead of a lot of people, they're feeling rage, where's the weapon and who can I hit? Like, that's not exactly the question you want to ask rage. <laughs> you, want to, you want to get in the, in the ballpark of what it's doing. And understand what is the signal that created that emotion. Yeah. What is that emotion responding to? It's real. So find out what your entire organism is sensing here through the prism of anger. Well, thank you so much for sharing the language of emotions with us. Where can our audience find out more about the work that you do? You can come to my site, carlamclaren.com or my educational site, empathyacademy.org. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Carla. Thank you so much. 